thanks, Mari. Oh, um, we might so that Mari can go, just have see if there's any questions on those two topics, hearing preservation in acoustic neuroma surgery or complications. Any questions? Oh, Professor He. Okay, Professor, thank you very much for the beautiful lectures. I would like to ask you, sir, when when you do uh, surgery in case of uh, NF2, and we talk about the debuc debucking indications, when, mm -hmm. how about the, the indication for, for debucking? So the question was about indications for debulking surgery in NF2. Yep. Okay. Very, very good and complicated question. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's very difficult to make decisions in patients with NF2. And um, for instance, the, the one the picture I showed you with the large bilateral acoustics, that's a patient we currently have at the moment. We're trying to decide what to do. So, I mean, the trigger for surgery is increasing neurological problems. So that patient's developing increasing paralysis, basically, and hand dysfunction because of the brainstem compression. So that's the trigger for doing surgery um basically growing tumors causing neurological problems same as in in most other things forces you to do surgery especially if it's a large tumor which is usually what they are now the the question about debulking or subtotal resection versus total resection uh is a hard one to know pre-operatively um there are cases where we've been able to achieve a nice total resection in NF2 patients, but usually the tumour is much more stuck. The facial nerve is much more stretched over the tumour and difficult to save. Um, the uh, the tumours have often been previously treated with radiation, so they're more, infl more inflamed and more stuck. So quite a lot of the time we get in there in surgery and decide we're going to stop and leave a fair bit of residual tumour. But occasionally there are tumours where we are able to get a nice complete resection and at least preserve the facial nerve. We usually can't preserve the hearing, as I said, with uh, with surgery. So does that does that answer the question, hopefully? Yeah. I, I Although I don't do the acoustic neuroma surgery, I run the neurofibromatosis clinic. So I look after all the other a lot of the other tumors in these patients and the, my basic rule is to do as little as possible for as long as possible because there's always going to be another tumor in this disease so i think the safest possible resection only of growing tumors causing neurological deficit is is probably the the the, the best answer i think the debulking is a little spe specific to um Acoustic neuromas, although of course meningiomas, uh, you know, where you might go for a more aggressive resection if it was the only tumor, you you're really looking more for just a decompression. It's a terrible disease. Any other questions? I mean, most, oh. most meningiomas technically are only debulked. Yeah. Yes, Not that's true. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful uh, presentation. I just have uh, one question about the indication for the translab translab approach because mm -hmm. uh, the translab the translab approach you have many indication. For example, for the hearing loss completely. But do you think about the side tumor is uh, affected for your indication for the translab approaches or not? My question is about the about the side of the tumor. Because I see you yep. use the translab approach for the big tumor. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we we essentially have no size restriction for a translab approach. Um, it's good for big tumors. It's good for small tumors. As you said, it's we, it's usually our first recommendation in patients who have lost hearing or almost lost hearing or have no no serviceable functional hearing. But in terms of the size, good question. We have no restrictions on size. Now. There might be, I can think of a tumor, the, the one problem is very, very large tumors that go inferiorly down towards the frame and magnum. That is one area that's hard to get with a translab approach, and it might switch us to go to a retrosigmoid approach instead. 
Um, one caveat to that is sometimes we, we what we do to decide in translab approaches is look, look carefully at the anatomy of the temporal bone on CT. And occasionally patients have a high jugular bulb or an anterior riding sigmoid sinus where we can tell that the access is going to be smaller than normal. And that might also switch us to go retro sigmoid. But that's a rare situation. So yeah, the size of the tumor itself is not really a big consideration. Any other questions? Oh, one more. You've had more questions than anyone. <laughs> Popular topic. <laughs> you did the same question with the ultrasound. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I will add, I add, I add Dr. Owen about the ultrasound uh, uh, for uh, uh, the spire or brain. Okay. That's the end. It's okay. Any other acoustic neuroma questions? Okay, you can go back to enjoying your Sunday. And thank you for All being right. here. Thanks very much, everyone. Enjoy the meeting. Best wishes. Okay. And our last speaker for this session is uh, Girish Menon again. Um, sphenoorbital meningiomas. These are tumours that oh, plague me. Uh, so any questions for any of the speakers? Dr. Asmi, Dr. Awad. We know we have one question for Dr. Awad anyway, or, or, or Dr. Menon. Thank you. Uh, I would like to, uh, to know about the ultrasound for uh, vascular uh, um, information on the brain or spine. Can you say your experience? Yeah, so the question is about um, ultrasound for vascular malformations. Actually, the modern ultrasound, even the old one was very good, but the modern one's fantastic. Uh, I actually have some images which I didn't show, um, but I, I actually have an image where you can actually see uh, the M1, the aneurysm, and the M2 branches going off, um, and you can see that very clearly, and when, when an aneurysm clip is applied, you can see that the flow is obliterated to the aneurysm, but you still have flow in the aneurysms. So the answer is yes, it can show it very well. It can also show you direction of flow, so that's very important for like an AVM. I, I don't do AVMs, but uh, my colleague in the UK who does uses it for AVM because you can see, you can help distinguish between arterial flow and venous flow, which is very important for AVM. So yes, the answer is it can be very, very useful in Doppler mode. I have a question for Awad, can I? Absolutely. <laughs> the, the, spine, for the spinal endoscopy. So unless the lamina is out, it's not useful, right? For the ultrasound, absolutely, yeah. yeah, it's not useful unless the, so uh, the it doesn't help to mark the incision pre op right uh, before bony no. removal, yeah. No, so now, and the other question is uh, now there is a fad of uh, minimally invasive spinal surgery, even spinal tumors they tend to do tubular retractors and minimal. So, is it possible to use uh, because especially in this minimally invasive, when you have to be very precise in your dural opening, it has to be bang on the over the tumor. Yeah. So, so does ultrasound help in such cases? Yeah. It, yep. And they can be helpful. So the the ultrasound, which again I would urge you to have a look at back. One of the probes is a um, a burr hole probe. So it's a tiny probe. Okay. It's under a centimeter in uh, like a little square. So I think it's eight by eight millimeters, and that will go into a, a minimally invasive hole. And the idea is it will show you won't show you the anatomy very well. It won't show you a tumor very well, but it will show you enough between cord and tumor. And so it will be enough to distinguish that you've got enough of a opening uh, to know that your, uh, your, your decompression is adequate or your opening is adequate. So the answer is yes, it can be helpful even in the small opening cases, but you've got to have an opening directly into the canal. My last question, can it replace C arms? Oh, replace C arms in terms of bony uh, analysis, in terms of uh, pedicle screws and so forth. Will it help later on future? 
you get a lot of artifacts around bone. So if you bring it too close to bone, it won't show you, it won't give you the information. The artifact is too okay. is too much. I'm just wondering if it can avoid radiation, that nothing like that. We're not quite there yet. Not quite. Oh, Vincent, yes. Uh, yeah. Hey, sorry. I thought I uh, I have questions about uh, the reconstruction. You put a question mark in your slide. Sometimes I, I do it with my oculoplastic surgeon. And sometimes they say that you should reconstruct and they're always worried about this pulsating and ophthalmos. Just want to find out what your opinion on that. Thank you. Yeah. There are two, two aspects of reconstruction, which I'm sorry I didn't dwell into in much detail. One is the dural part. And when you excise the dura over the base, it is almost virtually difficult to have a perfect watertight dural closure. So generally, I end up taking a lot of fascia lata because the defect would be large. So the convexity part, generally, I'm able to tuck in and suture it to the residual dura. But the one over the sphenoid wing, it's generally overly <clears throat> just tuck it inside and then try using fibrin glue, tizzle and so forth and pray that it doesn't leak. The second part of the periorbita part, because generally this tumors, when you try to take out the tumor, the periorbita usually comes off with the uh, periorbita. Periorbita comes out with the tumor. So the next thing you see is sometimes if you're lucky, you find the muscles and the nerves in between the lacrimal frontal and trochlea. So <clears throat> you won't be left with any residual periorbita to reconstruct unless it is a very small periorbital component. So in such instances, also one option is to have some kind of fascia and try to reconstruct the periorbita. But uh, I generally, I don't recommend because it. I find it a futile attempt. It doesn't help you in any manner. So <clears throat> generally, a loose layer of surgical gel form is what I keep it over because it doesn't cause CSF leak in that area. So the dura, which they are tends, uh, facial atta, which you use for the dural closure, tends to stick onto that that gives you enough uh, seal. It's it's interesting, Vincent, that you, they always talk about the pulsatile, either proptosis or anophthalmus. So number one, my experience is that the proptosis correction is never as satisfactory, no matter how radical I am with the bone. So that to me seems I don't need to reconstruct the orbit. <laughs> I need to take more. And the second one is... Every case of pulsatile proptosis or anophthalmus I've had has resolved with time. So I've had a few patients who've definitely had pulsatile proptosis and you're in the recovery room and you're looking at them and you're thinking, oh, Lord, that's not going to be good for the long term. Every single one of those patients has got better. I don't know if anyone else has got, had that experience. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, four to six weeks. Generally resolved. It, it, it settles down. So... You know, there's a couple of times where we've done a very, very wide bony removal and we've maybe put some mesh or, you know, in the it, the the, wall, the roof of the orbit, not so much the, the wall of the orbit, but the roof to sort of stop the downward pressure of the frontal lobe. I don't think that's improved anything at all. Yeah. Oh, another question. Excellent. Who's this question for? Uh... I would like to ask uh, Professor Admi uh, Alias. Yeah. I have a small question uh, for you, Professor. Uh, does uh, we uh, had a patient, uh, we are diagnosed of um, macroadenome firstly, and uh, then we uh, uh, she underwent a uh, operation to remove uh, endoscopic and uh, the pathological result um, show a hypophysitis. Um, granulomatous, and um, since we have no uh chemo chemotherapy for this uh, disease, we just follow up and uh use the endocrine endocrine support for this patient, and uh, then uh, she uh, she kind of uh, no we have no recurrent in a uh, three month follow up, but in the operation we see that uh, we see that the uh, the tumor kind of way uh, difficult to uh, remove. Uh, it's not uh, as soft as user. So I would like to ask you, uh, that's, uh, uh, how can you share the experience in this kind of disease about the DC, uh, operation this season and uh, post-operative treatment for this kind of disease? Thank you. Okay, so hypophysitis is actually inflammatory kind of disease. Uh, like you have a, a 
uh, chronic granulation tissue. The treatment is if you have a hypopituitarism hormonal replacement and trial of steroid. Usually they give about two weeks or three weeks of steroid, and that's it. Uh, it won't likely it won't be recur, and it won't be uh, extending like other tumor. So uh, definitely you will expect uh, intraoperatively is a uh, firm uh, like uh, then adhesion. So that is uh, expected in hypobicitis. As I shown in one of the case that I go supraorbital, uh, it's very firm like uh, thick granuloma. Same like if you operate on TP granuloma, so there will be a, a lot of addition. So uh, if you do surgery, whenever possible, try to preserve the gland. But sometimes you cannot see if it is too huge. So treatment just follow up and then make sure that the hormone uh, replacement are being uh, given accordingly. So in our cases, most of the hypophysitis, uh, they need a long-term follow-up with endocrinologists, especially when they are hormone already damaged by the disease. No way that you can reverse it because it's a granulation kind of thing that destroy the gland. But some patient may have some preservation of function. Then that will be good for the patient. So I have a limited number of hypophysitis, but treatment is purely, I think, mainly by the endocrinologist. So our role is mainly biopsy and to confirm this is not something else. As we, it would seem with this disease that it would be better to not do surgery at all. Can you determine preoperatively from imaging without biopsy whether a surgery should happen or not? Yes, uh, definitely. Because if possible, uh, you can diagnose by radiology that would be good. But you must try to exclude other disaster, for example, like geminoma and so on. Uh, usually, we will try steroid first, follow up, do serial MRI. So any changes during the serial MRI, uh, in addition, you must send like beta ICG, alpha, fito, all the markers. Yeah? So if I exclude that, and most of the cases, uh, based on the age and the distribution of the lesion, we treat it as hypophysitis, anti-proven otherwise, without biopsy. So we only biopsy if there's a changes or it causes compression, for example, mass effect to the optic nerve. Because whatever you do, the hormonal damage won't be reversed back. So now it's follow up uh, first. Uh, Mo, you've got a question? No. no, just a statement actually, something we spoke about yesterday. I was just going to suggest, um, I know that maybe some of you might not be asking questions because of a language barrier. We were happy even if you wanted to ask a question in Vietnamese, we can get someone to interpret the question for you. So please, if you have a question, don't feel uh, that the, the English language should stop you. Just ask the question in Vietnamese. We can have people who can interpret. Okay, uh, thank you. May I have a question about, uh, with uh, Professor Menon about the spinorbital meningioma? Uh, we all know that the meaning, spinorbital meningioma is a, a big challenge for the neurosurgeon. And some author uh, suppose that uh, suggests that we do the we did uh, we do the FTOZ approach, uh, the frontal temporal orbital zygomatic, and it's a it's a the, the good option for remove all the tumor uh, the the bone and the tumor because it's big and spread tumor. What what uh, uh, what about your opinion about it? The FTOZ uh, approach. Thank you. Good question showed you in the, one of the slides, do not plan an FT, just a spin orbital meningioma, so I go for an FTZ OP. The bony involvement, so your bony craniotomy. What I would recommend is, uh, <clears throat> when you plan your craniotomy, look at the bony involvement, the hyperostosis, that gives you a clue as to how big your craniotomy flap should be. If, are, if the tumor is not going beyond the limits of a standard FTZ OP, fine, you're limited to that. But if you find the bony involvement, hyperostosis going way beyond that, then you'll have to extend your craniotomy. And in, when you plan an FTZO, as you saw, some of the cases, the sphenoid and the base is very, very thick because of hyperostosis. So it often becomes difficult to take it as a single piece. So I take it as as two pieces in such instances, sometimes three, in fact, the frontal temple craniotomy, zygoma is separate and the orbit as separate because sometimes the bone is so thick that a standard craniotom would not cut the entire thing as a single piece. So guide your craniotomy depending on the bony involvement. Then it becomes easier to drill the remaining part because always in fact of how big a craniotomy you do, you'll find 
there's some tumor extension going beyond that, especially the dura also. So it becomes a little easier to drill that later, the thinner part. Three piece, yeah. Have to yeah. plan for a single piece, but you can customize it intraoperatively depending on the thickness of the bone. I find this trying to do an OZ most of the time you, you actually can't make the cuts to do a single or even a two piece. Uh, usually I do a smallish, well, not small, but a, a, a localized craniotomy and then you're just drilling, 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 drilling. It's not, it's not the same as doing an OZ for a large aneurysm or, or something like that because the bone is so abnormal that you can't necessarily get your craniotome uh you are well if but you can you can use a small piece of mesh to to add to the cranioplasty there that's that's not too difficult that's probably that's usually what i do and the base you don't yeah you don't need to repair and that's where you get in difficulty with your oz Can I share a CP angle complication, which because that was topic of the discussion which you had. So I had recently two complications in CP angle, which uh, Professor Andrew alluded to one of them. Uh, one was a problem with I just lost the petrosal vein during uh, tumor decompression. The tumor became once the brain was lax, it started sagging and I guess some manipulation and I coagulated the <clears throat> sinus, the vein. I thought everything was fine. The patient had a large hemorrhagic venous infarct. So that is something. Nine out of ten times coagulating that vein, you might get away without any complication. But try to prevent that uh, vein, especially when you are doing a trigeminal microvascular decompression for trigeminal neuralgia. The vein comes in your way, and some others, in fact, suggest to <clears throat> take it off because it helps you in doing a better decompression. But just wanted to remind that possible preserve it because as I said, 9 out of 10 times you might get away, but sometimes that can create the problems. The second was a, a microvascular decompression for a hemifacial spasm, refractory hemifacial spasm after so many years. I thought I could just do a microvascular tried. Not only did his uh, spasm did not improve, he lost his hearing on that side also. It's perfect. I mean, I had no vascular injury at, uh, could, during surgery, but Everything went on well. I just don't, but I was just referring to literature. It could be spasm of the perforators, which Professor Andrew was uh, mentioning. During surgery, also handling too much of those labyrinthine arteries and so forth, they, they can cause spasm of the vessels and can cause cranial nerve deficits. So that is something, I don't know. I, that was a mistake. That was a complication which I happened, but I don't know what is the lesson that I learned from that. Next time I do a MVD, I don't know how to prevent that from happening because uh, I'm just wondering if any of you have an experience which could share. With you. The lesson that you learn is that neurosurgery is very dangerous. <laughs> uh, to tell you the truth, Girish, this is why I enjoy being a neurosurgeon for malignant disease. You know, true, people, people understand if they've got a cancerous brain tumour or they're having serious brain surgery, if they've got a neurological deficit, people understand that complications will happen surgery for benign disease spinal disease benign disease pain something goes wrong the patients are much less forgiving unruptured aneurysm very difficult sorry does anyone have any comment on girish's um uh, complication there <laughs> 